X Nihilo. Talking to Mr. Robert Zubrin, it's wonderful to meet you for a very special reason. You wouldn't probably be able to guess. It's because of this science fiction novel I wrote about 10 years ago titled Score that has this background story of a Mars expedition. The year is 2039 and the crew, just as the expedition lands, receives a video message from a 90-year-old Robert Zubrin, who'd founded the Mars Society in 1998, of course, congratulating them on the success. So you see, you're an old acquaintance and I'm happy you, we can welcome you to Ex Nihilo and talk about your recently published book, The Case for Nukes. What's great about your book is how it gives us boomers the story behind the fading of this dietic dream that we all grew up with about the future of unlimited possibilities. Even more important is that you've given us this beautifully written introduction to nuclear technology that's nuanced enough to satisfy even the hardest science nerd's hunger for details, while also giving us less scientifically bent this excellent understanding of the technology with its pros and cons, all the while making rocket science and space travel sound so fun and adventurous. And then you've included a do-it-yourself chapter on how to build a nuclear reactor. That's absolutely brilliant, I think. Now, I'm curious about the journey of becoming capable of writing such a work. I mean, as a young man who started out as a teacher, what enticed you to enroll in a nuclear engineering program? Well, uh, I had become a teacher as sort of a compromise with reality. Um, that is, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a space explorer. You know, my first memory of any major world event was Sputnik. Um, and while the adults may have been terrified of Sputnik because it meant the Soviets could hit us, uh, to me as a child, I was five, um, it was great. It meant that all these science fiction stories, I was an early reader, I was reading science fiction and about space travel, and this was all going to be true, okay? So I wanted to be part of it. And so I'm growing up in the 60s, and we're going to the moon by 1970, we're going to Mars by 1990, and so forth. And, and the so I was all in, one, uh, uh, part of a whole generation of young American, mostly boys, certainly, uh, that were, uh, you know, this was it. And, um, but then when, okay, I graduated high school in 1970, went to college, and I'm, first generation of my family to go to college. Uh, and the a couple things are happening. Number one, uh, the space program's vision is shutting down. Nixon, even as they're welcoming the astronauts back from the moon, they're canceling the plans to go on to Mars. This is coming to an end. Secondly, um, I'm getting the message. Um, look, you're growing up now. And it's all fine when you're 12 to want to be a space explorer, but now you're going to have to get a job. And 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 the uh, and, and when you're part of the first generation of your family to go to college, the concept of going to college so you can get a good job. And the um, so what are you going to be? You're not going to be a space explorer. Those are people. They they live on the other side of the TV screen. They're with the movie stars and the famous people. They're not the people. In our world, or the people on this side of the TV screen, these people can be uh, uh, doctors or lawyers, or you know, and, and so forth. And well, since I knew a lot of science, I said, "Okay, I'll be a science teacher." That's something, um, and it appealed to me more than you know. The people from the insurance company came to the university, and they're looking for people to train as actuaries, calculating insurance rates and i could have done that i was very good at math but it had no appeal to me whatsoever uh it had no higher purpose and whereas a science teacher does okay so so i did that and i did that for seven years or so um 
And so finally, there I am. I'm living in northern Manhattan and teaching in Brooklyn and taking the A train, the subway to work each way, an hour each way, and reading novels by Herman Melville about sailing the South Seas and saying, what am I doing here? And the, the, so by this time, I had heard about this thing called graduate school and where you could go and, and, and get into higher professions and such. Uh, which hadn't even occurred to me when I was in college the first time. And so I applied to graduate school in nuclear engineering because at that time it seemed to me that that's where the revolution was going to be. Um, and um, especially fusion power. And I got into several and I went to the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, where I uh, went and got a master's uh, in nuclear, and then I also got a second master's in aerospace because there was a significant overlap in the curriculum. Uh, and, and eventually I got a PhD, uh, although I got that after I left the university and was working at Martin Marietta doing design of interplanetary missions. Um, but that's where I came from. So I guess the experience of being a teacher helped me um, in my writing and, and also in my public speaking, because uh, I was able to develop a, a kind of a, a skill at reading an audience and seeing if they were following what I was saying and then changing the presentation to actually reach them. Um, and um, I also have had a, a private interest in history all my life. I've read a lot of history. Uh, and I've always found it a very useful way to teach anything, um, is to teach the history of things. Well, yeah, I think that's a dream we all, I, we were talking earlier, and we're about probably five years younger than you, I think. We're in the same generation. And I was on the West Coast, and even as a fourth grader, just lapping it up on TV about fusion power and breeder reactors and, and all of this stuff. It was just what we were geared to looking towards. And then it just kind of vanished, which is what you're talking about with the Richard Nixon administration. At that, I was too young, I think, to actually realize what was going on. And it's just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that. There was, I didn't know in detail what was going on, but I, I had a sense of it that this thing was not going forward. And, and, and um, well, of course, in the 70s, the nuclear stuff got into some trouble. And, uh, but fusion was still the great hope. And uh, I had as my advisor, as I mentioned in the book, Fred Reby. Um, who had been the director of the fusion program at Los Alamos and who himself had done uh, his PhD under Sam Allison, who was a member of a Fermi's team in the Chicago pile. Um, and um, uh, so, um, yeah, and I, I developed a love for this technology and I was, I, I would debate the Sierra Club, you know, in some public fora and, <laughs> and, 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 oh, how how did that go? Well, here's the thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, here's these guys saying we want to have a clean environment, and so we're against fossil fuels because they have smoke and and everything and pollution mm -hmm. and and all this. And furthermore, it's going to run out, so we have to limit industrial growth. And I say, well, here's nuclear power. It has no smoke and it's never going to run out. And they say, well, we hate that. And I said, why? And eventually I realized why they hated it. And they hated it, in fact, much more intensely than they hated fossil fuels. Uh, and the reason is because it would solve a problem they would need to have. Solve the problem they would need to have. And um, yeah. so mm -hmm. it de-justified that. Uh, fossil fuels don't de-justify them. Fossil fuels justify them. That's the dragon they're out there to fight. And when you say, but mm -hmm. there's no dragon. 
Well, yeah. that, that's worse, much worse than a dragon. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and the, um, so there it was. And then, so now, well, I, I, I went to work. I worked a little bit in nuclear. Eventually, though, I spent most of my career working in aerospace. And, um, but here we are, and it's the 21st century, and now these people are saying there's an existential crisis. We must shut down all industrial progress uh, because of the existential crisis of climate change. Um, so it's not just a question of there's a little air pollution here, a little air pollution there. Now it's the whole world is at stake. And, and you say, well, why not nuclear? Well, we hate that. And what mm -hmm. is going on here? And then you see catastrophes like um, the German uh, policy. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm the testimony the being here in Berlin. Power plants, <laughs> uh, supposedly because they were afraid of another Fukushima as if tsunamis and yeah. tidal waves ever sweep Germany. And, the, 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 and what's their answer? We're going to buy Russian gas. Okay. We're going to ship $80 billion a year to Putin. To, what, what's he going to do with it? Well, did you know that they are developing hypersonic nuclear weapons with your money? And, uh, well, sorry, but we're afraid of the tsunamis. And the, um, so literally, uh, and then of course, he takes advantage of their funding to invade Ukraine, and then under conditions of war, it's not conceivable that that supply of gas could continue, and where do the Germans go? They go to coal. So here's the, the yeah. people who are, are greener than green, uh, and they're chopping down forests and burning coal, and they have five times the carbon emissions of France. Um, the, 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 you know, um, because of this complete irrational uh, 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 campaign. And um, so, uh, okay, but first of all, let me tell you, I, I believe global warming is real. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I so do we. accept the data of the, the International yeah. Panel of Climate Change of the United Nations. World's temperature have gone up a degree in the past century. And, uh, I, I think it's likely to go up another degree this century. Uh, but I don't think that that um, threatens the destruction of human civilization. I think that that presents certain issues that need to be dealt with. Um, but there is something that does threaten human civilization. Um, and that is the same thing that threatened human civilization in the 20th century, which was bad ideas. And... Yeah. We can uh, do that later on. In particular, one yeah, bad yeah. idea, which came in a variety yeah. of forms. What's curious is, how did you figure this out? What made what what brought it into relief for you that you actually see what's going on? As I said, I've read a great deal of history um, mm -hmm. in my time, and mm -hmm. um, I was very aware of the connection between Malthusianism and Nazism, yeah. for example. Gotcha. And mm -hmm. the Greens are promoting Malthusianism. Uh, they absolutely are. And the and they may think they're the opposite because they are left wing and Nazis are right wing. But these mm -hmm. categories are meaningless. Uh, it's like whose Spanish Civil War songs do you prefer? Um, that, that if you actually look at policy, okay, uh, these are fictions that, that the policy of, 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 for instance, the Greens are advocating increasing the cost of fuel and electricity, okay, this, and they call themselves left wing, this would be unrecognizable to, a member of the traditional left, say, before World War II, wh whose uh, raising the etra was protecting the poor against the rich. The, the, here, mm -hmm. 
these are reactionary proposals. Um, rigging up the price of necessities is a left-wing policy. Well, it's it's a reactionary policy. I don't know what left-wing and right-wing uh, uh, mean in this context. That they're actually, you know, promoting this policy, and they're promoting. You give the reader this lucidly detailed analysis of our currently available energy resources, making it abundantly clear that biomasses in their raw forms are much less energy efficient than the fossilized forms, and that nuclear technologies are much more efficient, and so much less damaging to the environment compared to biomass energy sources, logically making them a thing of the past. However, in this day and age, it's de rigueur to accuse anyone advocating nuclear energy of being a fossil, indulging in some glorious past, of denying climate change, and so on. While, in actuality, you are absolutely aware of anthropogenic climate change. You're not apocalyptic, and you're convinced Nuclear energy is the only viable solution for moving forward. So, how would you explain to one of your grandchildren in the simplest way imaginable that there's no way around our use of nuclear technology? The, the reason why there's no way around our use of nuclear technology um, is, well, there is a way around. We could retrogress. We could collapse civilization. But if we want to continue with progress, and and if we want to continue this grand project, which has lifted um, about half the world out of horrible poverty over the course of the past two centuries, um, and we want to complete this and lift the whole world out, we're going to have to increase uh, global energy uh, power generation by about five times. So these people pushing net zero and so forth, are solving or attempting to solve the wrong problem. The problem is not, well, how do we uh, stay where we are and substitute um, solar energy or wind or something for fossil fuels and see if we can maybe uh, we'll cut our energy in half, but then they'll make up the half. And then, No, we have to increase our energy uh, production five times. Um, and, uh, I mean, look... Uh, and let me explain why I say that. The, the average per capita income in the United States is around 50000 Uh In cash, it's a bit lower in Europe, but they have various social services. It's about the same, and we work it all out. Uh, 50000 a year. But we still have some poverty here. We still have poverty in America, and there's poverty in Europe. Uh, the, but, okay, the average world GDP per capita is $10,000. Okay, one fifth of what it is in the advanced countries. Okay, and half the world is below average. So, this is the main problem in the world is poverty. Okay, uh, poverty kills hundreds of millions of people per year. I mean, some by outright starvation, a much larger number through disease that is made fatal due to various degrees of malnutrition. Uh, and then there are the brutalization of conditions of life due to poverty, the, the lack of effective law enforcement, the lack of uh, um, uh, opportunity, uh, the, the, the brutalization of social relations. Um, the, the, all these things figure into poverty. And uh, this is the problem we need to solve. This is the biggest problem in the world. And if we were to make a serious stab at that, if we were, wanted to raise the whole world to the advanced sector standard of living, we're talking about multiplying the power generation by a factor of five. And that cannot be done with windmills or uh, uh, biomass um, or, you know, or solar power. Uh, and it can't even be done with fossil fuels. Um, the uh, now, uh, I, I don't think it can be done with fossil fuels. And if you attempted to do it with fossil fuels, then indeed the problem of carbon emissions would become quite serious, uh, with a, a fivefold increase in in carbon emissions. Um, so this is why we have to go nuclear. And look, 
This idea that we can deal with carbon emissions by increasing the price of fuel, which is basically the green program. We get right down to it. Okay. Um, the first of all, it's uh, ultra aggressive reactionary idea, and second of all, and so it's unethical, but it's also impractical. It has not worked. Okay. It's been 30 years or so since world leaders all embraced the idea that carbon emissions were a big problem and had to be stopped. And they signed a treaty in Kyoto just 31 years ago in 1992 and to stop the growth of carbon emissions. And since that time, global carbon emissions have doubled, just as they did between the 30 years between 1960 and 1990. And the 30 years between 1930 and 1960, and the 30 years between 1900 and 1930. Okay. And the reason why this has happened is because energy is intrinsic to producing and transporting goods, uh, it's intrinsic to the way of life, uh, to, to a standard of living. And people don't want to be poor, they just don't. Okay. And even tyrannical governments know that in one way or another, they have to deliver on people's aspirations to uh, escape from poverty, because um, that's ultimately where the mandate of any government is. Um, and so, therefore, since people are all uh, very interested in increasing their standard of living, and um, governments um, must accommodate that one way or another, um, and some prefer to appear to be leading that. No, none wish to appear to be trying to hold it back. Um, the the it it happens, so it's going to happen. So I would say that in the year twenty fifty, uh, worldwide energy use is going to be twice what it is today, and um, it. it this is not a question of substitution of uh, windmills for part of the power uh, or this or that. It's going to be double, and um, the and it'll double again by 2080. And um, I think there would be a serious problem if we tried to do that with fossil fuels. A problem of just doing it, and a problem of the consequences of doing it if somehow you did manage to do it. Uh, and that's why we got to go. There's just no two ways. So, Robert, as I read your book, I kept thinking how much you're a kindred spirit of Martin's, whom I first met when I first heard his lecture on alien logic. The figure of the alien, of being alien, that is our alienated abstraction from the world. It's something that's been inscribed in the foundation of Western culture since at least the alphabet, if not before. That's the meaning of the Greek word makane, which initially meant the cunning and deception of nature a defrauding of nature, as in the construction of the natural world, which at that point hadn't been yet connected with a device other than the power of imagination. And it was this machine, this universal machine, that our culture as humankind has stepped out of nature. This is precisely what you say when you wrote, to save the natural, we must embrace the artificial. This, by the way, is what gives your whole analysis its decisive twist. As an exemplar, you make it clear that radium or silicon crystal only makes sense if your culture has the appropriate technology. That is, as a way of having a symbolic order to think and understand it. In. I mean, the Romans simply marched over silicon, and none of them would have thought about exploiting it. How did you arrive at this decisive turn in your thinking? Well, it, it just... Look... It's just common sense. If you want to avoid harming nature, don't take away the resources that nature relies on. So the, if, it's much better for nature if you get your heat by burning fossil fuels instead of burning trees. Um, you know, And it's better still if you get it from nuclear power, which is completely divorced from the uh, power sources resources that energy that nature relies on. You know, who saved the whales? Rockefeller saved the whales by switching us from whale oil to petroleum oil. 
okay? The whales are very grateful that we don't use whale oil anymore as a basic resource. Um, you know, and the forest animals would prefer that you don't get your energy by cutting down the trees they live in. And if trees could think, I'm sure they would prefer that too. Um, the, 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 so this idea that somehow you're living the natural life by taking your resources from nature, um, it, it's a, a complete absurdity. And that's what's so fascinating about your thinking is that you're realizing that and think that. And so much of the world doesn't get that. They're all very busy trying to get back into Mother Nature and the natural world. And it's a construction that, that we've made up. It's how we, we've made up the world. Quite obviously, nuclear technology has fallen to disrepute and the dream of a progressive future has faded. This has been observable since we saw Paul Ehrlich's population bomb limits to growth and the like in the 70s. Psychologically, you could say a sense of alienation has taken hold. Let's let into the back-to-nature ideology. The version you are telling here, which follows every detective's motto of follow the money, is much darker. Because you make it clear that nuclear technology has become the victim of its own success and that oil companies in particular have had a vested interest in not being undercut on price. This has led to the absolutely shady situation of environmental protection organizations such as the Sierra Club and eco-warriors like Al Gore having allowed themselves to be financed by the oil industry and the German Greens taking Soviet money. Okay, so I didn't catch every word of that, but I think I've got the general thrust. Um, so, why is this happening? Um, well, look, um, <clears throat> limits of resources. Uh, uh, if, if if there isn't enough to go around, then human aspirations must be constrained, and therefore someone must be empowered to do the constraining. And so, therefore, this is uh, a justification for tyranny. Uh, and uh, therefore, intellectuals who espouse this ideology will never lack for sponsors. Okay, and um, so. You know, um, and because they're making the case for tyranny. And this is why Ehrlich became a superstar like that. Okay. Uh, now, also, you, you have to realize that if there isn't enough to go around, um, this provides justification um, for, how can I put it? Um, suppressing or exterminating the people that we don't like anyway. Um, and um, and there is a dark side to human nature that, uh, you know, uh, has no sympathy for people that are uh, sufficiently uh, different from us uh, and uh, doesn't want to see them enjoying the same things we enjoy, um, and certainly doesn't want to see them enjoying them to uh, the exclusion of us enjoying them, uh, sees them as enemies. They are the other. Uh, and therefore, you have uh, this justification. Uh, and so, you know, look, uh, I've written another book, which I don't know if you've read. It's called Merchants of Despair, um, which traces um, the anti-human movement from Malthus um, through Darwin, through uh, the Nazis, and then into the post-war population control movement and environmental movement. And the the, the common thread here is um, and I mentioned Darwin. Darwinian natural selection is is true for uh, primary driver for evolution of 
biology. I'm not denying that. I wouldn't deny that for a minute. But um, he was very rapidly picked up as justification for European imperialism, survival of the fittest, uh, various reactionary social policies within uh, advanced nations as well, um, as, as justification for that. Uh, and, and his theory of uh, natural selection is, while valid for biological evolution, is not valid as the source of human progress. Human progress does not occur by superior nations exterminating inferior nations. Human progress occurs through, uh, and there's a fundamental reason for this, which is that uh, humans can inherit acquired traits, which animals cannot. And furthermore, not only can inherit acquired traits from their own parents, they can inherit acquired traits from anyone. That is to say, inventions are acquired traits. And that means that inventions made anywhere by anyone ultimately can benefit everyone everywhere. And therefore, um, the opposite of the national social Darwinism, um, which is essentially what Nazism was, um, um, uh, is true. That is, uh, you know, Germany today has a much higher standard of living than it had during the Third Reich, despite the fact that it has smaller territory and a larger population. Why? Because of the advance of human science and technology, which has been a global project to which Germans certainly have contributed, as have many other peoples, including notably people they were trying to exterminate. Uh, the, the, and so, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, so so this is is wrong, but so th this is uh, counterfactual ideology, but appears to be true. It appears there's only so much to go around, and therefore either we are going to get it or they are going to get it, and we should be the ones to get it. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it's a justification for the worst conceivable policies and. Um, with no rationale whatsoever. Um, the um, and and I I want to undermine the theology. You know, uh, Hitler said he said he said this idea of perpetual progress and plenty achieved through science is a Jewish plot to undermine people's belief in the necessity for war. Now. It's not a Jewish plot, but it does undermine people's belief in the necessity of war. And I wish to undermine people's belief in the necessity of war. And therefore, I wish to uh, destroy the Malthus premise that there isn't enough to go around. I think there's plenty to go around. And I think the more of us there are, and the more better situated we are through education and political freedom to engage in, in invention, the more resources there are going to be. Because, as I said in the book, there's no such thing as a natural resource. There's only natural raw materials. It is human creativity that turns materials into resource. And therefore, the more creators, the more resources. And that's why there's far more resources available to every person on Earth today than there was 100 years ago. And there's far more 100 years ago than there was 1,000 years ago. Because of human creativity. At the end of your book, you come to this conclusion, one which I find is exceedingly compelling, where you come to talk about neo-Malthusianism. This inevitably arises when you convince the economy has become a zero-sum game for limited resources. And this initiates something like a symbolic civil war, one which we just written about as Enzensberger's molecular civil war that he explores using Hannah Arendt's thinking on morality. And you link this to the national socialist mindset. Both Hopkins and I found this remarkable. What can you tell us about how you arrived at this conclusion? Well, to me, look, the, the reason why I'm for human expansion into space, and Mars being the most favorable location for that, but the more general uh, proposition is it's the desire for human expansion into space. And for Unlimited technological progress enabled by nuclear energy is the same thing. 
it is to show that resources are infinite. Okay, that look, you know, the average piece of granite has two parts per million uranium in it and eight parts per million thorium. And if you were to convert that to nuclear energy, that kilogram of granite would at least as much energy as 100 kilograms of water. So we're surrounded by mountains of energy if we introduce the appropriate technology. And of course, with fusion, one gallon of water has enough deuterium in it to use the equivalent of 350 gallons of water. And, and then here you have Mars. Okay, well, if we can take a rock and take make energy come out of a rock, which is what nuclear energy is, okay? It's like Moses taking water out of the rock. Okay, by, okay, the, 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 we hit the rock, nuclear energy come out. Mars can be made full, uh, rich in resources once there are resourceful people there. And there's no point killing each other, fighting over provinces, if by working together and using the better side of our nature, we can create living planets. Um, okay, why fight for provinces when we can create planets? Okay, and the, 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 and, and this is the answer. And, now, in certain ways, the nuclear energy appeals directly to the most practical side of people. Here's a source of energy. You can make cheap electricity and so forth. Okay. But still, people like the Club of Rome, you know, say, well, yeah, well, this and that, but ultimately there's only so much here. Okay. And Trying to convince someone who's embraced that argument is like trying to convince a mathematically illiterate person that there's an infinite number of points in a line segment. You know, if you have a line segment that is one centimeter long, can there be an infinite number of points in this? Well, if you understand mathematics, the answer to that is yes. But if you are an uneducated person, it seems like a ridiculous proposition. Nuclear energy is showing that there are infinite number of points in the line set. Going to Mars is showing that there's a line that extends infinitely in both directions, and that even a mathematically uneducated person can appreciate would have an infinite number of points. So these are two different arguments for the same proposition, that resources are infinite, it is human creativity, that defines resources, and the more of us there are, and the more free we are, the more resources there are.